record the lectures, every lectures through the drill, so yeah. you have access to it uh, after all. And this course is about relativistic quantum field theory. So you have a chance to go out now if you're in the wrong classroom. So this is QRT class. Um, we meet Monday, Monday and Wednesdays here from 1 p.m. till we will be kicked out of the room. Open the happens around the 30. Um, I am, hope you know, if not, I am this person. Okay. Uh, I work on elementary particle theory, I work on field theory. Um, so this is the first course on quantum field theory. So we're going to take a course to develop what it means to be quantum field theory, why we need quantum field theory and domain developers. Okay. So that's going to be journey we're going to take. And then next semester, there's going to be second part of the QLT. If you're more interested in going into the deeper inside of the QLT, including radiated corrections, renormalizations, and many other aspects of symmetries, including spontaneous symmetry breaking, and, and so on. Anyway, so there's a lot of uh, conceptual and technical things to be learned about QLT. If you're interested in pursuing your career as a theoretical physicist or experimental physicist as well. Um, good. So a uh, couple of things couple of uh, uh, logistics that I want to discuss. First, I see that 17 people has registered officially. So I see your face here. You can like escape. I know you, you are. Um, and then I know there are a couple of people who are interested in auditing this course, okay? So auditing Chang'e, if you, okay? So any of those of you who want to audit this course, maximally welcome, okay? So all this should be completely publicly open and you should be calm, enjoy, ask questions, do homework too, if you're interested. <laughs> but your homework will not be great. Because that's not my portion of the work. It's TA. Oh, by the way, here's TA. Can you stand up? So TA for this course is Young Ho. Uh, he hopefully will be maximally useful <laughs> in that respect. And especially the first usefulness of him is that any of you who want to audit this course, please send an email to him. Okay? Please send an email to him. And give your name, if you're okay with that. Uh, probably want to tell whether you're undergrad versus grad, grad student. Either way is fine. Okay, we are not doing secret you know, investigation about it. I just want to know. And another useful thing might be that whether you know you want to pursue condensed theory, higher theory. Or statistical theory, or any any you know field of research they're pursuing. This is just for fun, okay? So that I have some sense. What are the portions of audience that I'm, I'm dealing with? Uh, what else information do you need? You don't need a phone numbers, I guess, right? Okay. So I mean, this is important because then, yes. Ah, yes. Good. Very good. See, we have experts. We need to create a lot So your ID, okay. Otherwise, your cost. We are not be able to contact you. Because uh, there is a website called KL, KLMS, hopefully you are familiar with it. And then uh, if you provide these information to our PA, do you want to come and write down your email address? Uh, address uh, and they can send. Uh, if you don't want to. Well, well, you can just find me a name by writing my name. in the email address. Yeah, there are probably no like that. Ah, uh, yeah, so. Good, here we go. Thank you. So please, please send your email with this information to him nicely. And so then he can uh, add yourself to KLMS. So whenever we have, I have to send out announcement or posting the homework or any, any course materials, you have access to that. Okay, is that clear? Okay, so how many of you are actually auditing this course? Just, just that sense. Okay, roughly half. So it's extremely important that each of you actually send. Okay, to do so. Um, next, how many of you are high energy theories or want to pursue high energy theory? Just to have a sense. About 6%. How about condensed matter theory? Oh, actually more. I was wrong. So, how about experiment? Why not? How about statistical theory? 
What else? What am I missing? Gravitational theory. Okay, good. Uh, so half and half. Uh, I will not take it about that by improving my nature. I just want you to know. Um, good. So that's that's about the logistics. What am I? What else? Oh, uh, good. So uh, all this hour is after each of the class. Whatever you have a question, don't wait. Okay, pump into me. Just ask. Right, but, but today, today is the exception. Don't talk to me after this class. I have to scale because I have a big deadline to satisfy today. today. Okay, so I have to immediately scale. I have to work on something until 5 p.m. So today's exception, but other than that, you can grab me, ask questions right after the class, send me an email, make an appointment for the first uh, uh, meeting, you can ask questions. Is that, is that clear? Okay. Um, good. So, uh, course evaluation, is that important? I know it might be important for at least the grad. I know at least know one of the grad. So course evaluation, I forgot what I said in my syllabus. Assessment is likely to be based on four problem sets, which I will give you some. <laughs> Final exam or student presentation. Whoa, scary. I haven't decided whether I, I'm gonna make a final exam or a presentation. And attendance, so attendance is important. Okay, you're not going to learn a lot. Otherwise, why are you here? Right? So attendance, attendance is important, especially for those of you, of you who, who register for, for this class. And um, what are the references? Textbooks. So um, I'm still deciding uh, what I'm going to follow, but I'm going to mix up stuff. So I found last night. That actually, I started liking this book that um, my follow closely. Yeah, okay. So, there is a book called Quantum Field Theory. Lectured by Sidney Cole. Oh, lectured. Oh, okay. So, at least. Uh, for the first couple of weeks, uh, I, I may follow some of the content presented in this book. And by the way, in case you don't know, Sidney Coleman, who was a professor at Harvard, uh, is known for physicist of physicists, meaning he taught world class physicists. All right? So he already was on, at the cutting edge of the development quantum field. He had the deepest insight every single moment of development. Okay? So, anyway, so that's that. Two. Um, yeah, then there's this classic book, An Introduction to QFT by Askin Shredder. Oh, Shredder. So I might miss up again in the first couple of weeks some of this stuff, or just to come up with my own arguments. And then uh, there's a more recent book called Quantum Field Theory. At the same level by Professor Ahmed Quartz at Harvard. Um, and then there's a book called Quantum Field Theory by Mark Shretton. And finally, Peter Quantum. Uh, fields masterpiece by Stephen Wayne. Okay, so these will be, you know, I'm not saying that you need all of them, you have to read all of them, you have to measure all of them. I'm not saying you cannot do that. So, but follow my lectures. So primarily, I start looking at this book, I start looking at some of that. Uh, I'm gonna pick up some of the stuff from this book, but not a lot, because you can uh, destabilize your mental. So I'm not gonna do it. You see, you notice that the ego behind this title of this book is like the quantum theory, okay? This is the theory book. Uh, of the field theory. Anyway, so I, I just noticed. Uh, 
Okay, so these are the references. Uh, you can have a look. Any questions before we start? By the way, interaction is key, okay? If you have any questions, try to share, or first of all, think about it, and share it with someone else, including myself, and try to resolve it, okay? If you accumulate those little questions, over the time, at some point, you do not think. Because you have to literally tackle those questions. Every single moment you have a question, don't let uh, uh, be with you all the time. All right? It's key to get rid of any question. OK, so with that, um, let's get started. Unless there is any questions. All right. So uh, what is QFT? So everybody. Took a note of this, right? This is very good information, which will become soon. So you have a chance still to look at it. So, uh, what is quantum field theory? So, I'm just going to talk about like five minutes or ten minutes, but on you know, big picture level. So, what is quantum field theory? Quantum field is especially we are talking about relativistic quantum field theory, meaning a field a theory of quantum field that uh, enjoys or has a, a relativistic invariance, which we will we will talk about uh, in detail. So, relativist quantum field theory is logically a synthesis of quantum mechanics with respect to relativity. So, the set of quantum mechanics obviously does not coincide with the set of special relativity. Okay, and, and there is only a subset that is consistent with the principles of quantum mechanics and principles of spatial relativity. And historically, it turns out that this uh, synthesis or addition of the two uh, uh, main theoretical structure uh, turns out to be extremely subtle and challenging. Okay, you cannot just match together and hope that everything works out. Okay, oftentimes things will start breaking down. And so, Discussing this synthesis in a very rigorous manner is presented here, but it takes like effort and time. But uh, I don't recommend you do it now because then uh, you might leave the room immediately. Okay, so that takes a cut. But then you, so in other words, you need to be prepared to even understand. So in this course, for the first couple of lectures, I'll try to give you a flavor of it. Okay, some of the some of the discussion might be somewhat uh, robust. Some of the discussion might be somewhat first grade, meaning handy way to it. Okay, because yes. making every single thing is mathematically tied, takes an effort and time. All right, now, but then uh, what do we mean by quantum mechanics and spectrology? What are the logical ingredients that goes into that the addition of these two concepts? Okay, so let's first talk about a little bit of that. Okay, last chance to be part of this course. Okay, so, so uh, first of all, let's, let's uh, talk about that relativity. And here, obviously, you took a course on modern, modern what's called modern physics. Is that the right name? Okay, you learned special relativity, Lorentz boost, all the concepts and confusions, like, you know, why is this guy older than me, even though it's been, and we, we have learned all that. So, but then in this language, uh, by special relativity, basically we want to understand what it means to be relativistic theories, which are those set of the time today not about. And uh, mathematically, that, that is answered by a certain set of transformations known as the form frame, which include. And then, not that it is completely separate, but there is this notion of uh, causality, meaning you cannot modify the food you had last night, right? You cannot do that. And then there's a closely related concept of locality. So uh, the goal could be that you want to be familiar with these concepts, technical details, you want to know how to deal with them. Okay, and by quantum mechanics, 
I mean, first of all, uh, there should be a notion of probability. So the fact that there is a notion of probability is tied to the fact that, you know, I'm just listing concepts that we will eventually explore, okay? Uh, the fact that, for instance, there shouldn't exist any uh, negative norm states in the reference. And these are uh, negative norm states known as sometimes of ghosts. There are many ghosts you will see before. The QFT is full of ghosts. And then eventually, your job is to identify this ghost. This is a good ghost or bad ghost? Bad ghost, kill it. Okay, that, that, that's the lot of play you have to learn. This is the one that of ghosts, bad ghost. That you, you don't want to deal with it, or rather, you better deal with it, kill it. And then uh, there should be no kind of a conservation of preservation of probability, which in fact is captured by the fact that uh, operators should be unitary. So there is a unitary evolution. The unitary is another key concept in quantum mechanics. So often, when we check whether something is consistent, with both the special relativity and quantum mechanics, basically you want to check whether something is uh, consistent with the Lorentz variance, something doesn't violate the causality, things are local, and everything is unitary. Okay, so we are we are gonna play play this game to see whether they are they are fit into the tie in a consistency with all of them. Okay. okay. Obviously, one thing that I, I missed here is that, which we will deal with, there's a concept of quantization. Quantization means that if you start with some classical theory, how do you pass on to the quantity? How, how to make classical stuff into quantum mechanical stuff, right? So we're gonna deal with that. Okay, so, so these are the main concepts that uh, we have to, Okay, so so far so good. I just listed the names. So uh, let's talk about adding special relativity to quantum mechanics. And let's try to see like with, whether we can have a sense or ready to sense whether there may be non-trivial thing going on here, right? So uh, then you can ask yourself, when would the special relativistic effect be important? You can ask the question first, right? Do I have to worry about any special relativity quantum mechanics all the time? The answer is no. If you are dealing with hydrogen atom, why would you worry about that? Right? You already learned how to solve the problem, right? Or, or if, you, if you are dealing with some lattice system with the manifest non-relativistic dispersion relations, you don't have to worry about adding special relativity to the quantum mechanics all the time. Right? In that case, just stick to the quantum mechanical framework and it really works. So when, when would, so first question is, when the special relativistic effect or is important? When do we need to worry about that? Oh my goodness. When should I? So in other words, let me just give you a concrete set of suppose I give you a part of the event. Right? So if it is absolutely free, non-relative to the particle, you know how to how to describe this given like pure web, you know even how to construct the momentum operator, you know how to solve set up the stretching equation, you know how to solve it, right? You learn that. Now, I'm just telling you, when do I start need to worry about special relativistic effect in dealing with this quantum mechanical system? Well, the, well, the answer be? Uh, I'm asking when momentum is 2B. Yeah, good, exactly. So when momentum, P, or energy in a similar sense, right, start becoming of the order of mass. Because then this part is start moving very fast, right? And then when the, the speed of this particle getting close to the speed of light, we have to worry about special relativistic effect. Okay? Now, then you can ask again, when this happens, what could go wrong with my, my quantum mechanical system? Like, what could go wrong? So that's number one. So that's number two. Oh, rather, 
you just put a cut on another patch. What are possible subtleties when that happens? What can happen is that um, quick answer to this question, which we will invest, investigate in a slightly slow, systematic way, is that when the energy of the system exceeds, say, the mass of particles, then what can happen is that there can be um, many particle productions. Okay, because I have enough energy, I can start producing particles that I never ordered, uh, I, I never asked them for. So you see, oh, I just wanted to write down this Hamiltonian and then just be happy with it and describe the quantum mechanics. Then the special electric says, no, you have to include all possible many particles, say in your system. If you don't, then you'll start making all one mistake in your description. It's not only a quantitative mistake, but you, as you will see, there is a conceptual mistake, meaning some of these sacred principles will start becoming vitally. Okay? So at some point, you are first to think about all possible states accessible by the amount of energy you have. And then you ask, what is the consistent way of adding all those extra degree of freedom that you never thought about in such a way that things are consistent with all these sacred principles? Okay? So with that, um, let me write down the motivation uh, motivation, uh, equation. motivation equation, theory that possibly motivate this, this puzzle, and then I want to uh, spend the rest of today's lecture on this. Any question? So far, okay. <laughs> Okay, so let's let's uh, try. Let's put it down. Try. Okay, so non-relativistic version. Let me again write down non-relativistic single free particle here. Good. So I know this is great. Now, and then what we do is that we set up the shredding equation, right? First of all, we set up a uh, Time independent shredding equation that you learn how to solve it. Then, oh, I can even understand time evolution, right? So, okay, so we can now learn not only the statical aspect of the theory, but also we can understand the dynamics of it because I, I started learning about time evolution. So, this is how, how you deal with this system, right? Good. And then, this is consistent with the unitary. Because this time time evolution secretly is controlled by into the IHT, which is manifest the unitary evolution. So you learn all this. Now let's see what might be the dumbest possible trial you can do when you try to make this part of relativistic. And first trial can come from the fact that, well, I learned that what the relativistic energy needs to be. And relativistic energy needs to be, which, oh, 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 wait, can I put this back, correct? No, I'm not. Gonna. I was worried about the factors we'll see here, which we, we will get to in Right? So this is a relativistic energy that you learn. So you might say, okay, can I use this one so again to just set up my quantum mechanical thing? If this works, Great, right? Okay, this again gives me manifest the unitary evolution. So it looks like quantum mechanics is intact, right? And to the extent that I can define norm properly and norm doesn't change over time, looks like there's a good notion of probability, unitary evolution looks like everything is great. You can ask if this is pathetical, we are done. We just made relativistic quantum mechanics and we never heard about the quantum field theory. So there's something wrong about this theory, right? So that, that, that will be the today and next like probably to see what's wrong with this theory, first of all. 
And eventually, you will learn that uh, in a more developed machinery that, uh, let me just say in a sentence, if some of you remember, that's great. If you forget, that's fine. Um, okay, so I'm gonna say two sentences probably, which is the, if you get it great again, so this thing, this theory in Lagrangian sense or even Hamiltonian sense is not analytic in momenta, not analyticity momenta signals non-locality. Therefore, a causal theory. So I said a lot of stuff now, okay? Eventually you should be able to understand what I'm saying, but anyway, I know this theory is sick. But at this level of uh, discussion, it's hard to see why this, is th this theory is sick, right? Looks like everything is normal to try. So that, that's how we want to eventually understand. Okay, so 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 we will analyze this 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 step for a while before we actually move on and construct the uh, construct the uh, um, more uh, consistent uh, field here. Now, in the context of this thing, let me say one thing quickly. Okay, you all learned that there is a uncertain uh, field, right? What does this equation tell you? In the context of relativist theory, this equation tells you the following. If you have a system with energy of the order of E, then there's a dispersion, meaning uncertainty in the energy measurement, right? And what this equation tells you is that um, you, can, you can go off of the average energy, meaning you can just all of a sudden crank up the amount of energy the system actually has, during a time interval that is controlled by this. Meaning, okay, you're, you thought that you're given energy budget of just E, right? But the relativistic quantum mechanical system says, no, I have a bank called the vacuum. And then I can borrow this gigantic amount of energy delta E, so long as I return within a time of delta T. Okay, if you don't return, you're bankrupt. You have to. Okay, which means that uh, unlike in the usual sense of quantum mechanics, just non relativist quantum mechanics of classical physics, you just have a gigantic amount of energy source. It just that the time that you can use is short, shorter and shorter, and just start using more and more and more energy. Which means that you can in principle create any sort of particle that can possibly exist in this universe. All right, so, so that, that, that's what uh, basically the essence behind this thing of that. When, once you start hitting the energy scale of the relativity, where relativity becomes important, then this issue comes in. So you have to understand the higher spectrum and then put them together in the system. Anyway, so that, that was the third item. Okay, so let's let's talk about the relativity theories. Okay, so before that, we're going to set up units, right? The physics 101, the first chapter is units, right? And it tells you, well, I, 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 was, I remember when I first opened this uh, uh, physics 101 book, in my first year in undergrad, reading through the units, I was mesmerized. Like, oh my God, I feel like I'm doing physics now. Because I don't know if these days, but at least there, there was an uh, example where they write down some equations, which looks like nicely fancy nice equations. But then this chapter explains that, well, if you check the unit here, the unit here, they don't match that, but this is crap immediately, right? I was like, oh my God, this is nice to know. So we're gonna deal with a lot of units, but in a maximally simplified unit because um, the radical physics are lazy. Okay, so by definition, I'm pretty lazy. So I, I want to simplify it. So first of all, uh, we are doing relativistic quantum mechanics system, right? Meaning quantum field theory. So relativity means about the speed of light, quantum mechanics about the constant H4, right? So we're gonna say it's okay. Cool, nice. So what this means is the following. First of all, um, energy, is mc squared, according to relativity. Obviously, I can start adding the kinetic energy to this. 
So what they mean is that the dimension, by dimension I mean eventually mass dimension of energy is the same as mass. You can do another one, momenta is m times b. Again, the fact that c is one meaning any velocity doesn't carry any dimension in this, this case, velocity doesn't carry any, any unit, therefore momentum should carry the same dimension as, as the mass or energy. Uh, what about the other one? So velocity is length divided by t. Okay, now it looks like a very big physics model, really. Right, so this is dimension list, which means that dimension, mass dimension, and length dimension of length, spatial length and time are the same. Okay, so we're going to do all the time. And finally, we learned this uh, fancy page. Yeah? So this is dimension list. And I learned this what dimension of the P, which is equal to E or M. I also talked about the length, which this equation tells me that uh, dimension of this thing is inverse of it. So we're going to do this all the time. OK? So big energy means short distance. OK? Big energy means short distance, or for short time, for something to travel. So this explains why particle physicists are crazy about the gigantic high energy colliders. right? We want to understand what's happening in so very small distance. What is the underlying fundamental, uh, you know, uh, ingredient in the universe? So you have to throw very, very small distance. There, you need a very, very high energy machine. Okay, so that's why we need a, we want to build super energetic colliders. Okay, so enough about the dimension. Now let's move on. But this will be, uh, you might say this is simple, done, but dimensional analysis is art. In, in, in theoretical physics, especially as, as you will learn. So now I'm going to talk about the basics of some basics of Lorentz variance first. So I'm not going to tackle the Poincare variance immediately, but I'm just first focus on the Lorentz variance. So uh, remind me in, in undergrad the these days when you take modern physics, do you learn Lorentz group or not? No, right? Okay. Um, how many of you are so sort of familiar with the group theory? Okay, some of you. Okay, I mean it's okay. Uh, I didn't know anything about group theory. But I never that phrase. You can just start. So, what is Lorentz invariance all about? So, first of all, um, so in QFT, usual QFT, the relevant space time is what's known as Minkowski. Minkowski. Okay, so what is Minkowski space and time? Well, you'll, you're here now. You look around, this is Minkowski space and time. So Minkowski space and time, uh, let me just build up a short uh, wall by one a little bit. First of all, uh, there, is, there is a space and time. If you like the concept of manifold, there's a space and time manifold. And then, okay, let me draw on something fancy. Uh, although Minkowski doesn't look at all like this, but I just want to, I like to draw three things, so let me just do it. So, so then you have to mark each of the points in space and time and then give a label to it. In particular, in most of the time that we, we're going to spend, not most of the time, actually, all the time for this class, probably not, but most of the time, we are interested in talking about three plus one dimensional Nikos space and time, which means that there are three spatial directions. The one temporal time. Okay, 
So, uh, so therefore, we introduce a four vector to label each point of the Mikowski space and time. So that we introduce this x mu, uh, that mu runs from zero, one, two, three. This one, two, three for spatial direction, zero for the time direction. Therefore, it will look like x zero, x one, x two, x three, or I'm gonna write time, then spatial value. And you have seen another four factor example, which is the one four factor is spatial relativity. And that one is one component with the energy, and then there is the actual spatial momentum. Okay, good. So now I just introduced the structure. What is what is then uh, invariants that are relevant to this, this uh, structure? So by the way, uh, if, if it matters, it doesn't to me, but if it matters to you, uh, the four factor that come with indices that is sitting upstairs, meaning superscript, they, they are called contravariant or vectors. Honestly, I found this name just the uh, you know making computer and make scary. <laughs> okay. I'm, who cares about the name? Just that object. And since I introduced the name, I have finished, right? So uh, which we will introduce. If you see on the other hand the, the four vector with the lower indices, they are whole names. So very and you can ask where the name comes from. Is that how it is varying, right? So this name comes from the fact that how these guys will transform, vary under whatever relevant transformation we will talk about now. Okay, you know, it will be transforming under some kind of stuff on the contract area, and this will be transforming in a different kind of stuff. Cool. All right. So that that we that we will talk about. Okay, so um, now that once once we are given a space and geometry, then we want to know how to describe local geometry. We want to be able to measure the distance. We want to have to measure define the notion of inner product, and then we eventually want to define what it means to know as curvature, right? And so that uh, geometric information. So there's a matrix. This is this comes with a two symmetric is it? And this we call local geometry. We are not going to very fast in the direction like it's general relativity, but here by local geometry, there's many, many things under this local geometry part. But first of all, can I measure distance? So, so if I give on a point X and the point X prime, oh, by the way, when I write X or X prime, I mean there's always this, this thing. Okay? okay? Let me just actually do it because this is what to introduce to the motion. Okay? Then I can ask, oh, can I measure the distance? So obviously, in Euclidean step, okay, let me first. Before I talk about, okay, so let, let's actually talk about the Euclidean case. In Euclidean geometry, what is Euclidean geometry? Euclidean geometry is where matrix represented or mathematically takes a structure that has all the same signatures. So let, let me say that again. I mean. I know some of you are familiar with the QLT, you immediately know what I mean by that, but suppose you never heard of the matrix before. And if, if somebody give you a vector X, which is represented as XI, does that make sense what I'm writing? This, this is mathematically wrong. This is a single component, this is the three component of the vector. One, two, three. Now you guess, yeah? So this is a three dimensional vector. And then if somebody gives you another vector, y1, y2, y3, and then if somebody asks you, oh, can you do the dot product? Then you say, no, yeah, of course. Yeah. So then, and now I'm, gonna, I'm going to do that. So I'm using 
Einstein information information, right? Is that cool? Are you cool with that? Yes. Okay. So repeating in this index is the sum order. Now let me stress. Euclidean, you see, you are summing all the components with the same sign, right? So what I mean by that, x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3. So basically summing with the same sign, plus, 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 right? This is a rule, meaning uh, this includes the fact that you are in, you're doing this math in what's known as the Euclidean geometry, where the metric, which this can be written as G I J X I X O Y. So this is the plus plus plus, and then if you just follow the summation, you ended up with the both this. Man, this is really confusing if I write that back. So I didn't mean that. I meant that there's all plus sign here. Right? So that, that's what this, this thing in code. So matter provide you, first of all, what is your rule to do in a product? Right? And in Euclidean geometry is characterized by the fact that it comes with the same signature, same sign. Now let's ask what about the Minkowski geometry? Okay, not Euclidean geometry. Now uh, there rules are slightly different, and that raises a lot of questions. When did we start? One? Okay, as usual. Surprised. Okay. So in Minkowski, first of all, the metric of the flat Minkowski space and time is given by plus one, minus one, minus one, minus one. Okay, so, so there is a distinction between time and then spatial. Direction. I said distinction. I'm not saying they're different, but you know th there is a machinery built into the formalism such that I can keep track of which direction is time, which direction is uh, a space. Okay. Now, according to this one, now I can define a distance. First of all, let let let's define in the product. So if I give them two uh, four vectors x mu by mu, okay. The four Minkowski sets in a product Oops. No. again, I summation convention is applied, but then you already notice one important thing. Okay, I thought so in a sense, because in, in Euclidean, you don't care about up and down, you just write everything in the same floor. Okay, Euclidean again, you don't care about up and down, just write on the same floor, right? Like everybody is super super free. In, uh, in Minkowski, it's important to keep track of where you're up in this or down in this. As I, as I alluded already, because they, they transform differently. So you have to keep track of which one you're talking about. Now, here, first of all, Einstein's summation convention in Minkowski is different, at least contextually or notationally. From Euclidean in the sense that the repeated index one down, one up is a summation sum. Although if you open the book by Max first, he's gonna write everything on the same floor. You know, what the heck is going on? Okay, anyway, I'm saying that's usual rule. All right, so repeated index one up, one down is a sum over. Here, okay, and then let's actually write it down. What is this? So I'm just gonna literally write it down. So x zero. Y zero minus x one y one x two y two x three y three right I literally wrote down the definition of it so so temporal direction is treated slightly separately not necessarily for different footing but separately from say, uh, spatial direction so that you can keep track of you know which one we're talking about is it more time like or more space like as you learn. And then we can define now distance. So obviously, I break that question. I can ask, oh, what is the distance in quotes? Okay, in Minkowski terms. Now you know how to deal with this problem because uh, you learn vector space once you introduce inner product, right? Now you can define a distance as an inner product of the same vector. So I can literally do it. 
So G mu x not mu. Yeah. Okay, so you can do that. Or I can write that infinitesimal version of that. So this means like very small infinitesimal distance. Then I can write it as G mu dx mu dx mu. Think so I have a small segment. Okay, instead of the finite separation, if I'm given a very small segment, I can define small distance. All right, good. Yes. It seems like distance can be negative in there. Very good. Yes, in this case, that's correct. And in fact, that, that, that comes from the fact that the setup has this disparity between the temporal direction and then, and then the spatial direction. So since there is a question, let me just then define the concept immediately. So for instance, if I'm given a vector x, there are three possibilities, right? x squared, once again, x squared, Defined according to this, this definition, if it is a positive, you see that it's more like this has a bigger weight than the spatial part, right? In other words, one example of that thing is entire spatial like component is zero, or there will be time. In that case, that actually describes literally time evolution without moving at all, right? So there will be, it's fair to say that this factor in because of this uh, space and time, it's like time wise. Because it's literally one example is uh, time, uh, clicking the time without, without doing any more. And obviously, we can we can now mathematically talk about all these three possibilities. So let's first talk about this. In this case, there's a more way from the spatial part than temporal direction. So first of all, we can immediately figure out the name to call the space time. And one example is that like time doesn't change at all. And there's only some spatial component. So it's like if you're familiar with this, right? The temporal direction, there's the x direction, that. The first example was literally pointing back to here. So it's just literally going through the time. And the second example is literally sitting here. So it's literally separate from you and me without talking at all. Okay? We're not communicating, we just separate it. Chair, me, you're happy. So that configuration is a space like. Okay, now what about this? It's called either null like or sometimes light like. So this happens when there's the exact same point between the two. And that is described by this, as you may know, that means that who can who can be on this particular line? And that is possible only if t is equal to x. But remember, we are working in the unit where c is one. So that means x over t, which is velocity, which is one. And then it's satisfied by the fact that if it travels like speed of light, right? So in that sense, this can be satisfied by any physical stage that is traveling as fast as light. OK, so that's why it's called not light. And this separation will be important in understanding physics of relativity. OK, good. Any other questions? So I'm done with the basic stuff. So I'm now I'm going to do this for the very large book. In like, in like, <laughs> Uh, yeah, let me define a Lorentz symmetry and Lorentz group, and then I analyze the uh, details. Question, yes. Sorry, so Linkos gives a G mu V. G mu nu? And you, this one. Metric. This is metric. So, metric, Yes. So, the question he said was, this looks, he, I think you are doing this as a mapping that takes two core vectors and then are putting the scalar value. Yes, continue your question. Good. So let me clarify that. Okay. So let me first. So this question was this question seems to say that 
there is an object, tensorial object called the metric. What it does is that if you, somebody has you two four vectors, then you can do this math, and this does output the nice scalar number. Okay, meaning just give you you know product value. All right. Then, but then he noticed the fact that here I have a two indices down, here two indices up. Then do I have a sense of understanding this thing in, in this language too? The answer is yes. So let, let me clarify that. So first of all, um, first of all, uh, which way? So 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 here, first of all, what I meant by this equation that I just raised the indices means that in Euclidean space, Euclidean space. I'm just saying that this is the same as that. There's no difference, or also at the same time, I'm saying that this is equal to that. So in other words, in Euclidean, there is no difference uh, having index down or up. They're just the same object. And this is related to the fact that there is no kind of raising and lowering in this business, lowering in this business. So what do I mean by that? So in general, if somebody gave me counter-variant for vector in Minkowski sense, which we can really turn this Euclidean story to, then what I can do is that I can do this. If you like, you can flip the order of the index if you make, make it more comfortable. We can get the covariant for vector. So in that sense, metric can be viewed as a mapping of Contravariant vector into the covariant vector. Now, um, in the Minkowski sense, this has a meaning, non trivial meaning, because depending on whether this is the temporal or spatial component, they go into the slightly different way, because this guy has different sign here, right? So they treat separately, differently, spatial versus temporal. Now, when it comes to the Euclidean version on the other hand, I told you that the metric takes the exact same number, meaning it's just identity metrics. So identity metrics means that when you do this operation for Euclidean, so if I write ij, xj, I mean, it's the same thing. So identity, right? So this is identity metrics. Okay, and this does another thing. While in the Euclidean sense, the inverse metric is itself because identity metric, if you have identity matrix, so uh, inverse metric is the same as itself in Euclidean sense. This, this is all Euclidean, right? This is all Euclidean. But in, in uh, Minkowski sense, the inverse metric that in principle will be different from the original metric. So, how would you define inverse metric? So if you have a word metric, and then you have a metric, you want to get one, right? That's the de de defining equation for the inverse. So I can now start putting in this. And then one is delta, delta, mu, no. And then from that, you can get immediately Inverse metric, same as a liquid analysis. If this is up, okay. So in Minkowski, given a metric, the inverse metric is the one with indices up. I mean, just from this defining equation, you can derive that. And of course, you need this rating lowering property. Okay. So, uh, yeah. What did I say? No, uh, we have four minutes left, right? So we have to end here. So, uh, oh, thanks. That makes way more sense. So I was like, what's going on with time? So 2.15, uh, beautiful. All right, I'm relaxed. <laughs> because I haven't even started the main thing at all today. Well, now I have, I have one minute to say something. When you study QFT, or in general, any physics, there are two aspects to this, always. One is technicality. 
Meaning you just don't know, you know, how to understand this math part, how to do this uh, raising and lowering operation, later how to deal with the gametric gymnastics, tensor co contractions, oh man. So that's technical part, okay? You have to learn it. You have to be familiar with it. I'm writing a lot of stuff which are about the, you know, technical stuff, okay? You have to conquer it. Why? You want to build a house. You don't know how to do the fabric. Forget it. Right? But once you are on top of those technical parts, then you can do real physics. Right? You don't worry about all this stuff. Now you start thinking, what does this mean? What does that mean? What does this mean? What do I learn from this side? What does the equation uh, actually you know, guide me? But that's after you can actually conquer the technical part. All right? So if you are burdened, if you are burdened when you study something, by this technical part, remember that you just are going through this technical part. You are not confused. You are just not familiar with those stuff. Okay, you're not facing something difficult because physics is difficult. You're just facing something that you have learned before. So you have to be familiar with that. It takes the time. All right. So be simple-minded that way. But once you go through that, then you start using your brain. Okay, you have to turn on. Don't forget to turn on. Often you forget to turn on because you're so used to this. Well, I'm not thinking, I'm not thinking, I'm not thinking. what are we doing? You're not doing business. So you have to distinguish this too. Okay, and then you have to actively on and off your branch. And the second point that I want to make is that you have to teach your hand. I say a lot of times this thing, my students know very well. You have to teach your hand. Don't think that you understood something. No, you, you have not. Until your hands really start writing something. Only then you're ready. This is a part of this, you know, equipping with technical stuff. Okay, just viewing something, just listening something, that you follow something, that's not that you understood or you made something yourself. Not yet at all, not even close. All right, so your hand has to learn. All right, so with that, Okay, I have, I have 10 more minutes to go. Very good. So let, let me define now Lorenz. Lorenz. Well, Lorenz transformation first. All right, so uh, the Lorenz transformation are isometry of So what is isometry? This is just the name. Don't be scared by the name. Isometry means in a very loosely uh, uh, phrased sense, which I will define more carefully immediately, leaves metric invariant. So let's let's be concrete immediately. We don't have to wait the time, and we don't actually have a time. There are some hints. So we define a line segment, which I write as inner product of the line segment of this cell, right? So we have a written data. So suppose suppose there is a physical line segment. The X meal. Okay. And then I can I can try to view this as from one frame in the X frame. And then we, we can try to view the same thing in the second frame. So this one is just one of the coordinate transformation. Coordinate transformation is not like actual part of the physics, it's just the choice of frame that you are gonna take to describe your physics. Right? So here we literally did a coordinate transformation. And obviously, this should not change what I mean by this. Right? There's a geometric object. It doesn't matter which frame I'm, I'm taking to use to describe that thing. So, um, so in other words, uh, consider, consider, 
coordinate transformation, which is a spatial time. So there's x mu goes to, let me just write in a simple notation, x prime is equal to lambda times x, where if I write now with the indices, there's an x prime of mu component, which is mu nu x nu. So this is a linear transformation. So I'm not taking the most general coordinate transformation, but I'm taking only a linear transformation, which I'm not done yet. So if, if, you, if you like, the most general coordinate transformation will be a like random function of original coordinate, right? It can be highly nonlinear, this can contain x to zero part, linear part, x squared, whatever. In principle, I can consider crazy coordinate transformation. Right? But I'm saying, in the context of understanding isometry, and therefore the Lorentz transformation, I'm saying, first, I'm going to consider a specific class of coordinate transformation, which is linear in original coordinate. Okay? So this is x independent. So far, so good. Then I'm going to ask that this guy should not change what I mean by distance. So let's work it out. Let me write in two different ways. So dx squared is g mu nu. Let me write in the new coordinate system, meaning prime mu prime mu nu. Right? So I'm just measure the distance in the new coordinate system. And then I'm gonna write it as prime nu dx alpha dx alpha. So I just literally write this guy in this way, chain roll. Beta. Okay, so this is the mathematical identity so far. I haven't done anything. Good, I just did a chain rules. All right, so then what is this guy? So this guy can be read off from the definition of a set of coordinate system transformation of the theory, right? The real of that guy with respect to that thing is a stat. This tells me mu nu, mu alpha, New beta dx alpha dx beta. So if this were to be the same as original distance measured in original x coordinate system, right? That's the requirement. Whenever, whenever you see equation with equality with this, this mark, I mean, I'm demanding that. Okay? So that, means, that tells me that this should be equal to. Metric in alpha beta. Then I know that this is the expression of the distance in the original x coordinate system. Okay? So here is the equation, define the equation for Lorentz transformations. Among the linear coordinate transformation, I'm asking g mu nu u alpha nu beta is equal to alpha beta. Any lambda that satisfies this thing is called isometry. In particular, if the metric that I'm talking about is for the Minkowski metric, meaning here metric is plus one minus one minus one, minus one then that is Minkowski isometry. If I take another metric, say it describes what's known as anti zero space, then this whatever lambda that says by this equation is isometry of anti zero space. Right, so pick your favorite metric. I'm just picking this, this Minkowski one. Then this basically gives me a set of transformation that leaves that metric invariant. If you take a different metric, you might get a different set of symmetries. Is that clear? So that is the notion of isometry. <coughs> By the way, uh, I've been carefully writing this quotation mark whenever I write metric in this form. Uh, so if you are curious, should I know that? You should have that. What if I miss it by this throughout the session to see if you can figure it out? I'll tell you that this is first place. This mathematically is not correct. Is that enough? Look. This is the matrix. This is anti symmetric two times. 
Oh, symmetric to tensor. Very good. <laughs> okay. So symmetric to tensor and symmetric to tensor does not get the representation or expression in terms of matrix. Matrix you get if you have one up, one down in this. Like delta, delta, alpha, beta. Yeah, this is changing one, 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 one. Okay. But but I will change. Okay, that's why I put quotation marks all the way. Now you know. Okay, so seven. So I can go all the way up to the 15. That's the yeah. oh, okay. okay. I don't have to keep down here. There. So by definition, then you see this is a Lorentz transformation. Set of Lorentz transformation leaves in a product in the area. So let me say that again. So by definition, this Lorentz transformation, right? Leaves in a product in the area. Well, if I had A mu B mu, if I constructed A dot B, which is G mu nu, A mu B mu, we can check that this is equal to transform the guy that transform. Okay, check it. Just from the definition, you should get immediately successful. Right? So it doesn't change the angle. Okay, that, that sort of transform we're talking about. Okay, it doesn't change the angle, it doesn't change the distance. Later on, not this course, not even next and after course, but maybe in your life there sometime. There are other sets of transformations what can define, where instead of leaving metric just exactly the area, you can ask whether there are transformations that goes into the metric times overall factors, overall, uh, overall. Over theta independent factors, just rescaling the thing. Meaning, is now in this case, since I changed the metric, I'm not leaving the metric exactly the same, I can change the distance. But nevertheless, I can change the distance in such a way that I only just, you know, change something, but the, 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 the angle doesn't change at all. All right, just scaling up. And such set of transformation is known as conformal transformations. And that's the topic for conformal field theory. Anyway, that's this court is not about that. All right, let's continue with the Lorentz transformation. Okay, questions. Am I too fast? Am I too slow? Just okay. 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 Very good. So let, let, let's analyze the Lorentz transformation a little bit. It turns out that. This set is not only a random set of those things, actually the set of those transformations forms the group, known as this example, Lorentz. So what is group in case you haven't heard of the group? The group is a set, here I'm just gonna write extremely short way. Group is a set of element, such that it satisfies, first of all, there exists an identity element which satisfies for any element of that set. So let me call that set to be G. Okay, so the group is a set G, and then there exists element called identity element of G, such that for any element of G, A times E, group multiplication, or E times A, Leave the that, that, uh, uh, object in there. So the group must contain what is known as identity. Okay? If it doesn't, that's not good. Two, uh, for any two objects, A and B, of the that group, the A dot B, the group multiplication, must be also the element of the group. So it should be closed under the group multiplication. Last thing, there is the inverse, what's known as inverse. Uh, element, the meaning of that element is that for any A, A times A inverse, or A inverse times A to be identity that's defined by the one. All right, so which means, roughly speaking, group is a space, meaning set of a point, where there should be notion of identity, okay, 
And then whenever you walk through that by multiplying other group elements, you should stay in that manifold. Whenever you should go forward, you should be able to go backward too. Yes. Thank you for the creativity. Sorry, can you? I think you missed out the associativity. Associativity. Oh, yes. Sorry, thanks. That's definitely true. Okay. Therefore, I can add one more element. Very good. So there is for A, A, B, C of element, A times B times C is equal to A, B times C, called associativity. Okay, so this is special structure. Anyway, so anything that has like this type of thing is known as a group. There are many groups appearing in quantum field theory, and this is uh, the first. Let's talk about it. So perfect. There is the room of multiplication, it's just the matrix multiplication of one's matrix. You, you're talking about this? Yeah. Good. So here, no, this, sorry, good. Th thanks for the question. This, I don't mean uh, in a product, because I used to use this notation so far. I mean that there is a particular rule. If, you're, if you, I give you two of those lambda, what I mean by multiplying those two. In this case, I, I really mean that since you see this is the one of one down. And they actually accept matrix expression. So by product of the two group elements, I literally mean matrix multiplication. Does that answer your question? Cool. Okay. Okay. So, so I was gonna say that uh, that there are set of uh, uh, this lambda form a group, and it is actually there's a name for that, which is a group. But there's a mathematical expression for that. And this Lorentz group, uh, first of all, we started out in O3, so, so you, you may not recognize what I mean by this expression. Let me just uh, tell you uh, uh, two more things. A, suppose, suppose uh, you're in Euclidean space, Euclidean 40 okay? Meaning, you're talking about the vector that has a four component, one, two, three, right? And in this case, O of four is a set of four by four, this is a set of four by four matrices, four by four matrices O in such a way that it is orthogonal. So orthogonal means this. So if you take the transpose of original guy in product with original guy, you should be return to one. All right? So that's what I mean by orthogonal matrices. So this notation means that it's a four-dimensional set of orthogonal matrices. And this is the one possible groups. Now, what I mean by this notation is that in our case, three of the components literally behave like Euclidean guys, right? They're the spatial guys. A temporal guy behaves slightly differently. So there's a slight difference between th three of the components versus the rest of one. So this location is, is, is meant to um, uh, remind you that uh, this is four by four matrices, but you know, it, that, that satisfies almost the criteria. There's a difference between three and the one, because I'm talking about three plus one dimensions. More precisely because the metric, so this can be phrased as this, one, one. So you can do this equation as literally that. And remember, what was one? That's literally, you know, Euclidean metric. And you recognize this equation is not, not nothing but you know four dimensional Euclidean isometry. Okay. But the defining equation for our Lorentz group, which I erased, was almost the same, but it was the Minkowski metric instead of Euclidean metric. Okay, so that's why there's a different name. Now we have to analyze the properties of it. We haven't uh, even started it. Now, okay, I think I have to stop here. But next time, what I'm gonna do first is that I'm gonna look into deeper into that. First, I will talk about you know, only one of the sub sub group known as proper of the Kronos Lorentz group. And then we'll talk about how this can be into that. How can we reach the rest of the whole of all three comma one element? And then we'll talk about the uh, internet conversion before we actually go back to the physics part.
So I'm just now building up some of the language. All right, uh, with that, any questions? Okay, so then we will meet on Wednesday, 1 p.m. Again, uh, today, don't follow me. I have a question. Okay. Yeah, can, can you uh, stop the recording in the store and the you can check with the. Uh, yeah. Ah, yeah, thank you. Cool. All right, thanks. Okay.